If you are visiting with us today, we are so, so grateful that, that you've chosen uh, to be with us. And it is our sincere hope that while you are here, you are able to worship in spirit and in truth, that you are welcomed with love, and that you will find a home with this family to assist you on your journey to our eternal home. The focus of our congregation this year has been on that word, home. Because the Bible is filled with metaphors and imagery related to the concept of home. In some cases, that language is used in reference to our families. And in some cases, that language is used in reference to the church. And in some cases, that language is used in reference to heaven. And so our goal this year has been to emphasize the home in all three of those contexts. But in order for our families to be strong, in order for the church to be strong, in order for us each as individuals to make it to our home in heaven, we must make Jesus Christ our foundation. So we've been focused on Jesus this summer in our lessons on Sunday mornings and We've been in this series entitled House Calls because to to study the life of Jesus, we framed it in the context of houses that he was in. And this morning, we want to continue that with another lesson from a house. So we're going to be focused on Mark chapter 2, which we read just a moment ago. But if you will turn back to that passage or remain in that passage, that will be our focus today. In Mark chapter 2, we're told in that very first verse that Jesus returned to Capernaum after some days, and it was reported that he was at home. Now, think about that for a moment. The language of Mark seems to imply that Jesus was at his own residence. Jesus on this earth, at least for periods of time, had a home. Now, I don't think he purchased this home or was renting this home. I don't think this home was in his name. More than likely, he's set up shop at Peter's home. You see, Peter and his brother Andrew were residents of Capernaum. And and if you go back to the previous chapter in Mark, to Mark chapter 1, we find Jesus in Peter's home. And so more than likely, what we have here is a situation where Jesus has established his base of operations. He's chosen the city of Capernaum, which he relocated to after his temptation, or after his baptism, after his temptation, after his cousin John the Baptist was in prison. He relocated to Capernaum, and he set up shop there. He was there so often that Matthew, in his gospel, in the account of this same story, referred to Capernaum as Jesus' own city, So this was his home base. And while Jesus is at home, so to speak, many miracles occur. You can read through the Gospels how in Capernaum, before we even get to the story we're talking about today, Jesus exercises a demon from a man at the local synagogue. He heals Peter's mother-in-law. And he engages in numerous healings at sunset that are just generically described for us because there were so many. But here in Mark chapter 2, he's at this house that is so commonly associated with him that everybody is there. The whole town apparently has come to this house. They've come to hear him teach. He's inside the residence And it's busting at the seams. It is so full of people that when these four men who bring their paralytic friend to see Jesus arrive on the scene, they can't even enter the door. They're stuck on the outside, but they believe if they can get their buddy to Jesus, Jesus can heal him. So they call a brilliant audible. Doesn't just hearing that phrase get you ready for football season? They call this magnificent audible. They climb to the roof. 
tear open a hole in the roof and lower their buddy down into the presence of Jesus. Now, to us, that seems kind of strange. That's kind of an awkward way to go about this process. That doesn't sound like a a reasonable plan, but it's because of our modern architecture. You have to realize that in those days, houses were single-story buildings with flat roofs and outside staircases. The way they were constructed back then was to give you a place on the top of your house where you could go work if necessary, where you could even sleep at night during those hot days when you could at least get the breeze on the roof of your house. You often had a space for your guests to stay up on the top of your house. So this was normal for them. It was normal to have a staircase leading to your roof, and your roof would have been sturdy. It would not have been flimsy construction because of all the activities you might have done up there. So this is completely in the realm of practicality for these guys. And what they've done is they've chosen an extraordinary measure to make sure their friend got to Jesus. Now let's read the remainder of the the account, beginning in verse 5. According to Mark chapter 2, verse 5 through 12, here's how this house call concluded. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. Now some of the scribes were sitting there questioning in their hearts, Why does this man speak like that? He is blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? And immediately Jesus, perceiving in his spirit that they thus questioned within themselves, said to them, Why do you question these things in your hearts? Which is easier to say to the paralytic, Your sins are forgiven, or to say, Rise, take up your bed, and walk? But that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. He said to the paralytic, I say to you, rise, pick up your bed and go home. And he rose and immediately picked up his bed and went out before them all, so that they were all amazed and glorified God, saying, we never saw anything like this. What's the most important thing we can take from this story today? What is the big takeaway from this unique house call during the life of Jesus? In my opinion, the the most important thing we can learn from this house call is not that Jesus had the power to heal something as horrible as paralysis. Because this is not the first nor the last paralytic that gets healed by Jesus. I also don't think the most important thing we can learn is that Jesus had the authority to forgive sins. Now, that's a big part of this story. That's an integral part of this story. But it's not the only occasion when Jesus forgave someone's sins during his ministry. We studied another house call earlier this summer. It was the house of Simon the Pharisee, and a sinful woman came into that house and washed Jesus' feet. And Jesus looked at her and said, Your sins are forgiven. I'm not trying to undermine the importance of Jesus' forgiving ability here. But I think there's something even more important for us to focus upon today. I think the most important thing we learn from this house call has to do with faith. See, I think when we look at this story, verse 5 might be the most important verse. Because what we learn in this story is First and foremost is that faith is visible. In Mark chapter 2 and verse 5, we're told that when Jesus saw their faith. Now think about that for a moment. Mark is telling us that Jesus was able to observe the faith of these individuals. Here's what's fascinating to me. In verse 8, we're told that Jesus knew in his spirit or perceived in his spirit what these scribes, what these teachers of the law were thinking. He knew it. He perceived what they were thinking. And whether that is divinely inspired or simply intuitive doesn't really matter. He knew what they were thinking, but he saw what these men were doing. 
Jesus saw the faith of this paralytic, and he saw the faith of that guy's friends because it evidenced itself through intentional, persistent, and even extraordinary action. As one commentator pointed out, faith in this account is linked with acting rather than with knowing or feeling. We know nothing about the beliefs of the four friends of the paralytic except that they take action. Faith is first and foremost not knowledge about Jesus, but active trust that Jesus is sufficient for one's deepest and most heartfelt needs. You see, oftentimes when we talk about faith, we kind of limit its definition. And we do this because we have a definition for faith in Scripture. If you jump over to Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 1, the author of Hebrews defines faith as the assurance of things hoped for and the evidence of what? Things not seen. And so right then and there, we automatically go, well, faith is invisible. Faith is not something you can observe with your eyes. Because the text says faith is the conviction of things not seen. The author of Hebrews, you have to realize, is is focused on faith from the perspective of of the believer. Mark talks about faith from the observer's perspective. So, so while Mark is focused on, hey, how is Jesus able to know the faith of the paralytic and his friends, the author of Hebrews is, is, is trying to communicate to us what our faith is built upon. So on, on one end of the spectrum, you have the author of Hebrews talking about faith is faith's construction and mark is focused on faith's evidence and the author of hebrews is not opposed to mark the author of hebrews described the unseen belief component of faith in this first verse but he spends the remainder of the chapter identifying the observable actions through which our spiritual heroes demonstrated their faith And so you journey through Hebrews chapter 11, through the the faith hall of fame, as it is called. And all these individuals are held up as heroes of faith. But what did their faith, or what was their faith comprised of? You go to verse 4, and you read that Abel offered. You go to verse 7, Noah constructed. Verse 8, Abraham obeyed. Verse 17, Abraham offered. Verse 20, Isaac blessed. Verse 21, Jacob worshipped. Verse 22, Joseph spoke. Verse 25, Moses chose. You see, you journey through the faith hall of fame and every, every hero's faith was evidenced through action. Every hero did something as an act of faith. The faith of these heroes was evidenced through activity. While faith may be built on the conviction of things not seen, faith is not meant to be unseen. If you have that conviction, if you possess that belief that God is our Father, that Jesus is His Son who came to live on this earth, to die on our behalf and has ascended back into heaven, then that faith ought to to be doing something. It ought to be evidencing itself. It ought to be observable and visible in some capacity. Too often, we want to relegate belief to the thing that's inside me that has no requirement to come outside of me. But that's not really faith. And James is the one who explains this the best. Look at James chapter 2, verse 17 through 19. James says, Faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. But someone will say, You have faith, and I have works. Show me your faith apart from your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. Now, James isn't saying works save you, but he is saying the faith that saves you is going to evidence itself through works. 
You're going to be able to see faith because of what is done. It's what you do are the receipts of your faith. And then he goes on to say this, if you look at verse 19. You believe that God is one. You do well. Even the demons believe and shudder. Now think about this. Why is he bringing up demons? Why does James feel the need to talk about demons here? That's just kind of out of the blue, isn't it? What James is trying to communicate while in the bringing up of demons in this passage is the fact that demons believe. Demons have that kind of faith. When Jesus encountered a demon-possessed individual during his ministry, do you know what the demon did? The demon had always acknowledged Jesus' identity. You can go over to Mark chapter 5. Jesus arrives on the other side of the Sea of Galilee, and there's a man possessed by multiple demons living in a cave. The demons called themselves legion. They come out to Jesus, fall down at his feet, and refer to him as the son of the most high God. Now that's belief. They believed the identity of Jesus. But did the demons do anything to act on that belief? Did they produce any fruit in accordance with that belief? No. That's the difference between the demons and us. That's the difference between demons and Christians. Both believe, but only one, only one shows their faith through what they do. That's the point James is trying to make by referring to demons in this passage. They had belief, but they didn't have faith because their belief never transferred into action. And that's why James comes to the conclusion for the second time there in verse 26. For as the body apart from the spirit is dead, so also faith apart from works is dead. Jesus could see the faith of, of, of these individuals in this story because faith evidences itself through activity. I want you to think about it this way. If first responders came upon a motionless body, how are they going to determine whether or not that body is alive? Well, they're going to see if it's doing anything. They may check for a pulse. They may listen to the chest for breath. They may open the eyelids to see if the pupils respond to light. And why do they do those things? Because the absent of doing is indicative of death. The absence of activity is indicative of death. If your heart's not beating, if your lungs aren't filling up, if your eyes aren't dilating, those are indicators of death. And the point that James is trying to make is that just like the human body, if your faith isn't doing anything, if there's no activity to your faith, then essentially it's dead. It really isn't credible. And the point is this, whether you're going to this passage in Mark, whether you're going to the book of Hebrews, to the 11th chapter, or whether you're going to James chapter 2, faith is not just a belief system. It's an active, observable lifestyle. Jesus saw their faith. Does he see yours? Does Jesus Christ look at you and see the evidence of faith? You know, the first step in that process of evidencing your faith involves the waters of baptism. When you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, 
You're then called upon to repent of your sins and to confess your belief. Pretty much everyone in Christendom is okay with that. Everyone under the broad umbrella of Christianity, no matter what denomination they fall under, what category of practice of faith they fall under, they all agree with that. But you can't go past Acts chapter 2 and verse 38 where Peter after being asked what the, the, the Jewish audience who heard him preach that day, what they needed to do, and he responds, repent and be baptized, every one of you, for the forgiveness of your sins. Because the waters of baptism are the means through which we come in contact with the blood of Jesus. And if you truly believe that he's the Son of God who died for your sins, then you're going to evidence that faith through taking that step. By being buried with him in water. But you know that evidence of your faith is also going to be there after becoming a child of his. Through your service to others. Through your participation in the growth of the kingdom. By sharing the good news. Through the contribution of your skills and talents and abilities to the growth of the kingdom. Through the fruit you bear. The way you treat other people. Can Jesus see your faith? That's the question you really got to answer today. But I think there's something else we need to notice in this story, while you ponder the seriousness of that question, there's one other thing you need to notice. You need to notice not only is faith visible, but it is also communal. Because in Mark chapter 2 and verse 5, Jesus saw their faith. I find that so fascinating because he's not just referring to the paralytic. He's referring also to the guys that brought the paralyzed man to him. The plural pronoun there implies that more than one's per- one person's faith was seen. And by implication, that means the faith Jesus saw was not only that of the paralyzed guy, whose sins will be forgiven, and therefore, obviously, his faith was involved, but it also includes those individuals who brought him to Jesus. Here's what's fascinating to me. Faith is routinely linked with healing throughout the Gospels. In Mark chapter 5, a woman with a 12-year-long hemorrhaging disorder believed that if she could just touch the edge of Jesus' clothes, then she would be healed. So she discreetly snuck up behind him and, and touched the edge of his garment. And Jesus felt the power leave him. He found the woman and he said, Your faith has made you well. In Mark chapter 10, a blind beggar named Bartimaeus heard that Jesus was passing by, so he started crying out for Jesus to have mercy on him. Jesus asked, what do you want me to do for you? And he said, I want my sight back. And Jesus said to him, your faith has made you well. And in Luke chapter 17, Jesus encountered a colony of lepers who begged him to have mercy on them. Jesus instructed them to go show themselves to the priest. That was the Mosaic law requirement to be deemed clean. Now they were still leprous when they left Jesus and started going to the priests. But on the way, we're told that they were cleansed. One leper returned to thank Jesus, and Jesus said to him, your faith has made you well. Do you notice the message, the link between faith and being made well? And it is all directed to one individual. My point is that for such healings to take place, all it necessitated was the faith of the one that needed healing. But here in Mark chapter 2, the faith of the paralytic's companions is also acknowledged by Jesus. Why? Why didn't Jesus just say when he saw his faith, Why did he specifically say when he saw their faith? 
maybe it's because the paralytic's faith and the faith of the men who carried him were intertwined. You know, we don't know who orchestrated the trip to Jesus. We don't know if the, the paralyzed man asked his friends to take him to Jesus because he had faith in Jesus to heal him. Or if the, the paralytic's friends came to him and said, hey, we're going to Jesus because we believe he can heal you. We don't know who orchestrated the trip. We don't know who authored it. We don't know who came up with this idea to go to Jesus. But it really doesn't matter because their collective faith was at work. Think about it this way. If the friends really didn't believe Jesus could hear this, heal this paralyzed guy, then when they got to the house and it was packed out and they couldn't get in the door, they would have just said, sorry, man, we got to go home. This ain't going to work. If the paralyzed man did not believe that Jesus could heal him, then when they got there and they started talking about taking him up on the roof, he would have been like, hey, guys, that's too much. I mean, y'all could drop me and I could lose my life at this point. I mean, I know I'm, not, I've already, I'm already paralyzed, but I don't really want y'all taking me up there. I, this is embarrassing. Just take me home. It would have been very easy for one or the other to bring an end to this campaign if they all didn't share the same faith. You see, we need to realize something about faith. We need to realize the power of of communal faith. See, my point is the paralyzed man got to Jesus because all parties involved shared a common faith in Jesus' ability to do something about his condition. Everyone involved in this story believed that Jesus could do something because it only takes one to compromise the faith. Their shared faith fueled their efforts to complete the mission. They benefited from one another, believing that Jesus could do something about this situation. I think this is why we have certain instructions in Scripture. I think this is why when you get to 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 14, we're instructed to not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. There is this expectation this call, this encouragement, I should say, for us to pair up with people of like faith. Do you know why? Because when you get around people who don't share the same faith, they will easily bring you down. That's why I'm amazed by Thomas, the apostle. The one guy who wasn't there when Jesus first appeared to the apostles. What, the one guy that wasn't there for the first resurrection appearance. And he doesn't believe them when they start telling him. That would have been an easy opportunity for him to say, Guys, this is too much. I'm out. See ya. But he sticks with them. He stays around people who believed even when he didn't believe. And one week later, guess what? Every doubt he ever had was remedied. But that wouldn't have happened if he left the believers. Paul appeals to light and dark in this very passage about being yoked with unbelievers. You know, when you put light in darkness, it still works. It still shines its light. But it's not very effective. If we turned out all the lights in this room and set a candle up here on the podium, everyone would be able to see the candle, but it's not going to do a whole lot for you in your seat. But when all the lights are on, even if one bulb goes out, the light of all the other bulbs carries it through. Communal faith has the power to keep us up when we're down. Communal faith has the ability to encourage the growth of faith, not discourage it. And I think that's also why we have this passage in, the, in Jude, the 22nd verse, where we're told to have mercy on those who doubt. 
Our communal faith is supposed to be helping one another along, to build one another up, to keep us going to Jesus even when we're at our weakest, even when we're ready to turn away. Our communal faith is meant to help each other get there. And that's what happens this day at this house in Capernaum. Their communal faith kept going even when the obstacles presented themselves. Even when they get to that house and it's packed out and there's no way to get in, their communal faith says, let's keep going. Let's figure something out. Let's come up with plan B. And the end result that day was a guy walked out of that house. He couldn't walk into the house. He didn't have to exit through the roof. He got up and walked out the door. Because their faith built one another up. It is much easier to have faith and act on faith when you are surrounded by other people of faith. And it's much easier to lose your faith when you are surrounded by people who don't have faith. So when we look at this house call, realize this. It teaches us about faith. It teaches us that faith is visible, and it teaches us that faith is communal. But before we go, I want to call your attention to one last verse. It's 2 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse 5, where we're given the instructions to examine ourselves to see whether or not you are in the faith. When you look at yourself today, when you consider your life right now, Could it be defined as faithful? Based on your actions, your activity, based on what you do, can Jesus see your faith and would he identify it as faithful? I'm certain there are some here today who cannot claim to have faith yet. If you're on that journey and, 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 and faith isn't something you can claim yet, we'd love to study with you. We'd love to share with you more about God's Word and help you come to understand who Jesus is and help you make the decision as to whether or not you believe He's truly the Son of God. And I'm sure there's some of us in here today who think their faith is good enough, who think the fact that they believe that Jesus is the Son of God is all that they had to ever do, and they've never taken any steps to evidence that faith. And I hope that as you read Mark chapter 2, and as you engage in this study, you realize your life should be evidencing faith all the time. And if your faith is not visible, maybe it's time to ask for help, both from God and from this community of faith. If your faith is not visible, we want to help you with that. And we want to encourage you to make it such. This morning, if you're here and your faith isn't what it ought to be, let this community help you. Turn it over to the Lord. Whatever your need is, we invite you to come to this front row while together we stand and sing.